This is episode 109 of The Variety Artist. This is John Abrams, your host and that guy that interviews successful variety artists from around the world every single week. I have a confession. When I first heard about this COVID-19 thing, I didn't take it seriously. On March 12th, I was sitting at a restaurant having sushi with a friend of mine. We were laughing at how everybody seemed paranoid and that this coronavirus was something that would pass pretty quick. Well, I got home that day to five or six emails canceling shows. Then on March 13th, ironically Friday the 13th, almost all my shows for the next two months canceled. Then throughout the last couple of weeks, most of my summer shows canceled. I finally admitted to myself that we're in this for the long haul and that everywhere in the world variety artists are hurting. Well, I'm shifting gears, folks. I want to help. Yes, I've had Chris Johnson on talking about polishing your show during this downtime. Yes, I've had Zivi Kivi on talking about how to make this an opportunity. Yes, I've been flirting with the idea that this may change the way things are done. But I'm not going to tiptoe around the facts anymore, folks. For the next few weeks or months or whatever it takes, I'm going to bring on people that can give you concrete advice on how to get through this. I'm dedicated to helping you with your specific needs. Today's guest will be talking all about having those kids at home, entertaining and interesting ways to homeschool. Next week, I'll be having Chris Michael on. He co-wrote the book on doing virtual shows. If you know anybody that has good sound advice on what to do to get through this, send them my way. We'll still have fun. We'll still make this informative. I'll still be interviewing artists about their performing art, but I'm steering right into the tidal wave. We're going to get through this, and I'm going to do everything in my power to help you. Enjoy the show. Welcome to The Variety Artist, providing aspiring artists and entertainers with in-depth discussions from top performers from all over the world. So get ready to book some gigs, make some money, and have some fun with your host, John Abrams. He's known as one of the top restaurant balloon twisters in the country. He has lots of accomplishments that I could list here, but on this interview, he's going to share some of his favorite homeschool projects with and without balloons. He makes it fun and fast paced so kids want to learn. Variety artist, I give you Dale Obrachta. Hey, John, how are we doing today? I'm doing pretty good, Dale. How are you doing? That, you know, that must be a line everybody says, hey, John, how you doing? That's right. And usually I say I'm good. Uh, but today it's it's like I'm in Southern California. It's 92 degrees here right now. I'm sweating my head off right now. Well, you could be in the Chicagoland area. We're gray. We're uh, trying. The sun's trying to come out. I think we have snow scheduled for uh, tonight. Oh, uh, probably 74 <laughs> uh, come about 8 a.m. So, yeah, just sit around here for a minute or two and. The weather will change. <laughs> well, let's get into your, your balloon career because you're, you're more known for your balloon career than anything else, right? Yes, I'd like to say that. I hope so. I, you know, 35 years in the business. I hope somebody knows me out there. <laughs> now, what can someone do with balloons? I know when, when someone mentions balloons, a lot of people think of balloon animals, a balloon twister, but there's a whole world out there of balloons. So give us, give us some. Well, basically, I am a balloon entertainer, not a balloon artist and not a decor person. I'm actually an entertainer. I do live stage shows with balloons. Mm. So my job is to entertain an entire audience, TV audience, no matter what it is, make it fun, exciting, thrilling. Uh, balloon twisting choreographed to music is what my fame is. I've done TEDx talks, twisting balloons to a presentation. Mm -hmm. I've done... All the craziness and silly things of starting out as a clown, twisting at birthday parties, all the way moving up to the corporate events. So anything you could do with a balloon, I may have done it already, which is scary to think about. So what kind of venues? You're talking about corporate, you're talking about birthdays, but what, what is in between there? I live in Chicago and I tell people I live in the third largest state. Or large, excuse me, third largest <laughs> uh, state with debt. No, third largest state. <laughs> Population wise, mm -hmm. there is a grand opening happening everywhere, except now there are schools, libraries, park districts, corporate events. There is something that's happening every day in this city. So the question is, how hard do you want to work? How hard do you want to hustle? What doors do you want to knock on? What do you want to actually present? Got it. That's the whole thing, because really in the corporate world, corporate has customer appreciation days. They have their family days, they have their company picnics, they have high-end corporate meetings, 
they throw parties for 2,000 people and the budget is a million dollars. So what's a couple hundred dollars for an entertainer for a couple minutes? Yeah. It's a strange world that we live in that we can make a living doing what we do. We're a small commodity. If I actually look in Chicago and I count the number of balloon twisters on one hand that is full time that have been around for 20 years plus, there's maybe about 10 of us. I'd really like to say all in Chicago that are full-time entertainers. That's probably the same in Southern California too. When you take that number into consideration, it, there's only six guys available. Yeah. Now this wasn't something I was going to talk to you about, but you've opened up my mind in thinking, gosh, there are a million events every single day for any entertainer, for balloons, for, for magicians, for, for anything. Hey, John, here's a number I, I, I calculated. I live in a mile by a mile, which that's my city limits. That's my boundaries. Mm -hmm. But the next city over, I got 50,000 people. And the next city over has 60,000 people. I have close to 200 restaurants within a, I'm going to say 15 mile radius. Okay. Think about this. McDonald's comes in and they say they need to have a population of 50,000 people open up a McDonald's. McDonald's opens it up based on region. So I sat down and one day and I decided, well, all right, there is 50,000 people on one side. 60,000 people, let's see, 360 days out of the year, let's divide that out. That comes out to be about 310 birthdays a day. Ah. Now think about it. If somebody comes up to you and say you got 310 birthdays happening every single day, which is going to take you 15 minutes in one direction, 15 minutes in any direction you go, and you sit there and you do the math and go, I just need three birthdays a day. Yeah. It changes your whole perspective. And that's just with birthdays. Yeah, that adds up really fast. Yeah. So now if you start taking schools, yes, schools start to go out a little farther, but there's a school event happening almost every day. If you take a grand opening, how many businesses are opening or anniversaries? Restaurants have anniversaries, just like grand openings. Mm -hmm. Some companies that when you start talking to them, they go, oh, we have 115 satellites and you know, we only do a customer appreciation you know, at every satellite. 115 times. Yeah, you sit there and you do the math and you go, yes, I'll be in on it. Yeah. In just how many days? Yeah. I have a client right now who's proposing a virtual show for me. Mm -hmm. They have 119 locations. Are you talking about 115 virtual shows or one virtual show for 115 places? Excuse me, 115 shows. Nice. There is stuff out there that, can boggle your mind when you really sit down and look at it. The possibility, I had one friend who always used to say, possibilities are endless. Mm -hmm. Really, you start to trip over the amount of work that there really is. Now the question is, where do you want to become a master of one? Yeah. I had a friend of mine many years ago, Bobby Hunt. He still doesn't remember this. Circus boy, Bobby Hunt, who we were sitting there talking and he basically says, you know, it's nice that you're a jack of all trade, master of none. I went, well, well, he, dude, you just whacked me with a two by four. <laughs> that's, that's a statement I've never thought about. Yeah. Because at the time, the old days, uh, like I say, 35 years in the business, I was in Rolodexes. Yeah. So what do you classify the magical balloon dude under? Hmm, his name is magical. Let's put him under a magician. Well, you know, he's a dude. Let's put him, he's more of a character. We'll put him in the character. Well, no, he's a balloon artist. We'll put him under B. Then when I'd call up the agent, he goes, yeah, you know, I, I need a balloon artist, but I'm hiring you for a magician. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, why are you hiring me for a magician? Because you're under M for magic. Yeah. And that's when I realized that you could spread yourself too thin too quickly by saying, yeah, you know, and I hear this all the time. Yeah, I could do magic. I could do juggling. I could balloons. I could do face painting. I could do stilt walking, unicycles. Nowadays, those are the people that don't get hired. Yeah, because everybody wants a specialist. You, yeah. you pay the brain doctor, the guy who's going to go in, cut your brain open and actually work on your brain a heck of a lot more than you're going to do the regular ear throat guy. Absolutely. That's where I became a specialty in balloons. And then when I narrowed it down, I said, hey, you know, there's three little categories for balloons, decor, entertainment, this line twisting thing. I, I want to be the entertainer. Mm -hmm. I even focused it down smaller. So now when my agent calls me up, they're like, okay, you're doing a show or you're gonna be doing a walk around for the corporate people. No, that, 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 that's the smart way to go to specialize in anything is a smart way to go. All right, so let's get off the balloon thing for a minute because this COVID-19 thing is just crazy right now. How has it affected your business? 
oh, <laughs> <laughs> it, it is it is refocused me. I mean, I'm still doing libraries just from my office. I'm still mm. doing carpet work from my office. Just did a delivery because uh, the president of a bank wanted some decor work dropped off to, to say thank you for those people working. So it is really weird that the work is out there, but it's in a totally different avenue. Hmm. I mean, Saturday Night Live is still on TV doing Zoom. Ah. And the interesting part is I kind of laugh and giggle because there's going to be the next generation that is in kindergarten that's going to come up and look at their bosses and go, Man, that's that uh, virus uh, boss, man. He's stupid. He can't read or do math, man. I wish he did some schooling. Yeah. We're going to have a generation that is a step or two slightly behind because there's a lot of education that's being lost. Yeah. It's no fault of the parent. It's no fault of the school. It is just that at the moment, our systems are not designed to do practical education. Well, yeah, let's get into that a little bit. You've been doing a lot of homeschooling stuff and keeping your kids up to date. What, what is your home situation like, even before we get into the homeschooling thing? Homeschooling, I, it's funny because as an entertainer, again, I, almost eight years, nine years ago, I went, hmm, there's a whole bunch of people homeschooling. Why don't I put together a homeschooling kit for balloons and focus it all around balloons? Mm -hmm. Because with balloons, you have to have sizes, you have to have shapes, you need colors. And you could actually start doing measurements and calculations and actually turn it into an engineering project. Yeah. That was the same thing that I started doing with some of my kids with the homeschooling. Even though I'm not homeschooling, I like to call it common sense education. Mm -hmm. I actually videotaped one of them that I put on my Facebook was knowing your tools. I saw that, by the way. It looks fun. I was, I was sitting there playing along with you. I had one person, and it, it's funny. It's a simple game, folks. All I did was go to the garage, pull out a whole bunch of tools, put it on the tray, and then I put two solo cups. Those were the buzzers. And all the kids had to do was slap the top of the solo cup. It crinkles. It makes noise. It's red. Bam, they slap it. They're excited. It, you know, who got it first? Bam, they'd slap it. I would hold up a wrench. And my son went, bam. Wait, wait, how, how old are your sons so people listening to this would know? They're 10 and 13. Okay. They're at the age where you should be able to send them to the garage and go, get me a Phillips screwdriver and have them come back and go, here you go. And you go, no, that's a slotted screwdriver. I want the Phillips one. Mm -hmm. They come back with a wrench. And you're like, no, dude, you know what a Phillips screwdriver is? Yeah. Um, it's not the hammer. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. So then they come back and they bring you the biggest... Phillips screwdriver that you could have. And you're like, dude, I'm, I'm working on your toy. I need something smaller. Yeah. They don't understand the tools because when I was a kid, I worked with my dad in the garage. My, my parents had two sayings. I followed them around all the time. And my mom had a, a saying, simple saying, someday, son, you're going to own a house and you're going to have to know how to take care of it. Mm-hmm. You're going to need to know how to iron. You're going to need to know how to sew. You're going to need to know how to put up drapes. My dad was like, come on, let's go. Let's put a fence in. Let's pull the fence out. This is yeah. what wire cutters look like. This is what pliers look like. So I brought that into the game. And my two boys, now I hold up the wrench and they're like, slap it, go, it's a wrench. Yeah. And I basically said it was a crescent wrench. Yeah. It was really exciting because... About a week later, I told my son, go get me a Phillips screwdriver. Sure enough, he went back, got the right one this time. Went, here, is this what you need? <laughs> Thank you. So, yeah, common sense is a big game we play around our house. So other than the, the tool game, which I love, are you doing other games? What other, other type of, of common sense homeschooling are you doing? When it comes to common sense, we made bread the other day. We actually went out and... We, we have an old bread machine. I pulled up the bread machine. I set it down. And went, okay, we're going to make bread. You haven't done anything in math lately. We're going to pull out the measuring cups. Oh. And it, it's like, okay, I need three quarters. Well, we don't have a three quarter cup. Guess what? We got a quarter cup. How many times do you have to put that in? My 10 year old's like three times. Yep. All right, here you go. All right, I need a quarter teaspoon of this. Here's an eighth teaspoon. You sure we don't have a quarter down? And he's digging through and he's like, <laughs> nope, how, how, what's that? What's a half of a quarter? And he's like, I'm not in school. 
I'm like, all right, man, that's an eighth. Okay, how many eighths do you have to put in? Yeah, you don't think you're in school. We also play the money game where, you know, you give the kids some money and they have to calculate it out. <laughs> My 13-year-old is not a big fan of school. He likes his Fortnite. He'd rather play Fortnite than do his homework. Mm-hmm. But he loves watching YouTube fishing shows. Yeah. I gave him an assignment. Dude, you want a pond. Now, he wants a pond. He's been asking for a pond for the last three years. Now, I live in the Chicago land area. Yep. If you don't understand, Chicago is beautiful to maybe November, December. We don't get snow. January, February, and March, it is terrible. <laughs> it is cold. We have snow. It's, it's just lousy weather. Okay. He wants to put a pond in. I'm like, dude, how are you going to keep this pod? He's like, I don't know, but the YouTuber I ain't know has a lake. He's in Miami, dude. Yeah. <laughs> it's 95 in freaking Miami. He's pulling water that's 75 degrees to 80 degrees through his pod. I went, we don't have a pond in our backyard. Yeah, I know. But we have one that's, you know, down the street. Dude, you're not going to be able to pull water down the street. So he finally realizes that. To have a pond, it's more than just bringing water to a hole. Mm -hmm. So I said, all right, you want a pond, figure it out. And he's like, well, what do you mean? Go on the computer. Tell me exactly what you need. Give me the full, how big of a pond do you want? How deep do you want? How much liner do you need? What kind of bubbler do you need? What kind of fish do you want? He's like, oh, well, I want this type of how deep does the water have to be? How many fish are you going to have? So I gave him the task of trying to calculate what it takes to build a pond. Yeah. He's like, you know, this is tough. I'm like, dude, this is what I do every single time I do any project. I just don't walk in the hardware store and say, oh yeah, give me two, two screws and a piece of wire. And I'm, I'm going to make this table. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm just going to guess. Yeah, you, you have to take the time out to calculate it. You have to do the math. As entertainers, we know this. How many times have you built a prop? And actually went to use the prop and went, this is a piece of crap. Oh, yeah. So these are things that I play with my kids. It's just to challenge them in different ways. My 13-year-old wanted to be a YouTuber when he was 10. So we sat down and went, all right, what does it take to be a YouTuber? Mm-hmm. All right, what what do you want to do? I want to do the gaming YouTubes. Mm -hmm. All right, do you have a gaming station? Yeah. What kind of gaming station you have? Got a PS2. Okay, you need a PS4, dude. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, I'll get Dad to buy me a new one. (laughs) What game are you using? I want this game. All right, what are you trying to hook it up to? I got my laptop. Actually, it's my mom's old laptop. I'm like, that's not going to work. So we sat down, we did all the finances, and I had them research again how much it's going to cost. And I'm like, okay, we're up to 12 grand here now. (laughs) Grandma loves you, but she doesn't love you that much. Yeah, I want to be a free YouTube sensation. Only 12 grand. Yeah, 12 12 grand and you have three followers. You, (laughs) mom, and your buddy. Yeah. How are you going to make money? And then you have to explain to the algorithm that, you know, for every million followers, you're going to get $100. Yeah. Yeah, these are the things that I tried teaching because when I was little, and and, and I still remember this, being in my pajamas, being in the family room, seeing, we all have, it's the local channel that you turn on, it's like four or three, this is what's happening in your government. Yeah. It's pixelated graphics. And I'm going back to the 80s, I was getting into computers, I wanted to be a computer programmer, I looked at it and went, man... I could put some cool graphics up there. And this was my old man. My old man looked at me and went, so who would pay for that? What do you mean pay for it? Well, you want a job doing it. Who's going to hire you? Well, you know, TV company is going to hire me. Well, why are they going to hire you? Because I could do some really cool graphics. So what's so special about your graphics that they would hire you? Mm -hmm. And he would always go through these series of questions. Here I am decades later finding that I'm doing the same thing when I go into my entertainment business. If I go into my entertainment business, I always go, who's going to hire me? Why would they hire me? Mm-hmm. What, what problems am I solving? What, what do they need? When it comes to playing with your kids, I mean, creativity is always the fun part. 
juggling. My 10 year old does a pretty good job of juggling, but this year he wants to be a baseball catcher, mm -hmm. which he's been working on. So I went out and I got him these uh, 16 ounce, they're two and a half inch or 2.8 inch, 16 ounce tossing balls. Mm -hmm. They're great for juggling. They build muscles. So he practices juggling those. Nice. When I work out, we call it uh, gym class. Come on, let's join the gym teacher working out. No! You know, we do some exercises for five, 10 minutes. And all right, go back to your game. <laughs> I saw an ad on Facebook today or yesterday. And it was really interesting to me. They had, I don't even know how to explain this. They had a flat board. And on the bottom of this flat board had a ball. So you would balance on that flat board with your arms and like push up position on that flat board had a video screen and the video screen had some sort of a video game on it. So the kids would play this video game while in, in a push-up position, moving the screen all around. And it said no gym required because they're having fun. Yeah. Right. They don't even know they're working out. I have also done with my boys when they were playing Fortnite. First one dead has to do push-ups. Mm. My 10 year old doesn't mind doing that because uh, he lasts a little longer than 13 year old. I wonder too, if it's a generational thing, because my dad did the same thing. You know, whenever I came up with some crazy idea and you know, I'm an artist like you are. So I came up with all these crazy ideas when I was a kid, he would do the exact same thing. He would sit me down and say, say, okay, so you want to do this? How about this? How much is this going to cost? How are you going to measure this? You know, and he would go through piece by piece. Whereas nowadays, I think the generations go, great, you want to build a, a chair? Go. When you think about it, our parents didn't have the option of just going out and buying three different choices. There were, you, you basically either built it or maybe somebody had it in the store. Nowadays, you go on Amazon and you find that there's 37 options. That's true. So that's changed. But here, let me ask you this question. And since we're talking briefly about parents, sure. what was your parents' favorite comment when you did something? What was their go-to saying? Well, my parents were divorced, so I had two completely separate ones. My dad wouldn't really say anything. He'd just kind of shake his head one way or the other and kind of stare at me because I came up with all sorts of crazy harebrained ideas where my mom was the opposite. She was the supportive one. So she never really had a saying other than, I think you can do it. You're the best at that. You're, you can do it. <laughs> my wife always, you know, they'll say something like she gets mad. She's like, come here, let me throat punch you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, which is atypical of a mom. You know, you just want to kill the kid. Yeah. But my dad used to have a saying. It's like, come here, let me rip off your arm and beat you with the bloody stump. <laughs> Is that his saying? Yes, that was his saying. Uh, yeah, Dad, I'm going to walk over, rip off my arm, and just start beating me with it. <laughs> I love my parents. They were my best friends. They actually were the vice president of my company, my corporate secretary. I worked with them for 13 years in my entertainment company. Oh, that's nice. You sit there and you, you shake your head sometimes at the things they would do. And you sit there and you try doing that with your own kids. It's the quirky little things that your parents do that we imprint on our kids. My kids are probably going to remember this time going, man, do you remember when dad used to do shows in his office? Yeah. I sat there running the sound system, man, while you were playing Fortnite, jerk. <laughs> we're sitting at the kitchen table and you, and you go, you look at my youngest and I go, so what'd you do at school? Nothing. I don't know. That was like 16 hours ago. Yeah. You know how many games of Fortnite ago that was? <laughs> That's how they tell time now? Yeah. Yeah. My 10-year-old wants to always, he, he's upset because there's a girl in class who like logs in at 12.01 to be the first one to log into their e-learning. Mm -hmm. He's getting upset now. He, he keeps coming in second. The, the craziness is this, these kids are competitive with each other with the e-learning. They don't care who gets the highest grade because they've all real, realized it's all pass and fail, but they are competitive. Who can log in? Or I've seen the opposite. Who hasn't logged in the longest? Mm. We, we got a couple of kids in the e-learning that for some reason, as parents, we get to see who have never logged in for their e-learning yet. My kids are grown and out of school, so I don't know anything about this e-learning thing. So they're logging on and on Zoom or one of the other platforms. Oh, you wish, you wish. <laughs> Let's go back to 1980 when the internet first came out. We put a PDF file up that linked to a document. 
That's what they have in our school system, which is oh. scary. They, they send a PDF? The, the first uh, two weeks, we had a PDF. The kids would link on it. My 10-year-old, I asked, I sat there. I said, all right, I'll help you do your homework. He's like, okay. I'm like, what are you going to do? A visual tour of the Great Wall of China? Mm-hmm. Excuse me, you're doing what? He, so he pulls it up on his tablet and goes, look, see, I got 360 view of the Great Wall of China. Wow, is it big? Okay, can I go? My 13-year-old is done. I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, oh, I had to just go to CNN 10, which is the CNN News. It's the 10-minute update. Uh-huh. So he had to go there, watch it, and then take a screen caption of some of it to send it to the teacher to show him that he watched the news. Oh, I see. I used to be a college teacher, and I used to tell the kids in college, part of your assignment is to watch the news. Mm-hmm. And I had students go, well, why? At the time, the news was not as partial as it is nowadays, it seems like. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. If it, if it bleeds, it leads. I mean, people yes. for clicks right now. Yeah. I've, I've noticed nobody dies now with the coronavirus that yeah. has been shot with a gun. <laughs> I live in Chicago, which has one of the highest rates. Yeah, I live outside of L.A. I know. Yeah, yeah. I I haven't heard of an honor student dying yet this year. That's right. And it's amazing, but you don't hear about that. Uh, yeah. But you're not going to hear that. You're not going to hear about the stab the stabbings and the shootings that you normally hear about. We we have our kids. We want them to watch the news. We we want them to to be educated. And the hard part is trying to get away from YouTube because YouTube is 15 minutes of everything. Yeah. They are speed watchers. They go through, they said it the other day, people are streaming eight hours of content a day being with this coronavirus. Oh, yeah. Think of it as a YouTuber, how much material somebody could burn through. They're talking about on Netflix, Uh burning through two to three series in one week. Yeah, I had Chris Johnson on just the other day, and he he said, oh, I just heard somebody the other day say, yes, I've watched all of Netflix. Oh, yeah, it's true. You, It's coming close. Yeah. My son just wants to you know, hey, can I get Fortnite on the computer? I got it already on my phone. Mm. And it's on my tablet, too. I could stream it and play it everywhere. So is that what they're doing to take up a lot of their time right now is our video games? Uh, yeah. See, here's here's where it changes, too. Again, I hear I heard it in your voice. Oh, they're playing video games? That was me two years ago. Go back five years ago, none of my kids are ever going to have a TV set in their room. I've heard that from friends too, by the way. Yeah, Yeah, we have two TVs. We have two TVs in our house. I grew up with one TV in the house. Mm -hmm. To be honest with you, there's junk on TV, so it doesn't matter how many TVs you have. Nobody's watching TV. Yep. Kids watch YouTube on both of them. Mm. They don't watch TV. Their generation is all YouTube. No, this is true. This is true. I've said this myself. That yeah. TV is almost dead. Uh, people my age certainly, well, actually, I don't even have TV anymore. All I have is Netflix and ESPN. But the younger generation, like my kids, who are now 27 and 21, uh, they rarely watch TV. It's all YouTube and it's all computer things. Yeah. And I sat there and I swore up and down, my kids are not going to be playing video games. They don't need to have phones. And my wife pulled me aside and said, honey, This is how they talk to one another. It's true. So when I say that my kids are playing Fortnite, my kids are actually communicating and playing with their friends. Hmm. They're having a conversation like we are having while playing a video game. Yeah. So as much as I sit there and go, you know, man, we really have to get you off that tube. They're actually socializing, communicating and still building skills because they're talking, interaction, laughing, having fun. And it is a distraction from being bored at home. Yeah, interesting. I looked at my wife and went, oh my gosh, I have worked a restaurant for 26 years, almost every Saturday night. Mm-hmm. She's like, oh my God, I know. I, I want you out of the house. <laughs> it's like, I've had Saturday nights free for 26 years. <laughs> And my son was walking with us. He's like, why do you want daddy gone? She's like, that was my freedom. Yeah, and then the mailman just keeps waiting outside every Saturday night and just doesn't know what to do. It's... All right, Dale, we're going to do Fact or Something John just made up. It's one of the Variety Artist's favorite games. Does that sound like fun? Sure, let's go for it. 
Is it fat? Or is it something John just made up? Ah. Okay, let's do it. Here's what's going to happen. I'm going to give you a headline. You tell me if it's true or not. And if it is true, tell me a little more about it. Go ahead. Here we go. First headline. Dale will be the next MLB commissioner. True. Oh, really? Well, I applied in 1980 when Bud Selick was trying to become a baseball commissioner. I read a book that talked about being aggressive. And I went, hey, this sounds great. You know, and so I wrote every major league. I just came across some of the envelopes. I still have some of their responses. I, I wrote to every baseball team and sent a letter saying that I would like to apply to be the next baseball commissioner. Mm -hmm. Five or six of them replied with the application form. Wow. I filled out the form. I sent it in. The next round came back and said, all right, list all your accomplishments. Oh, my goodness. So you're still in the running. Yeah. And I'm like, all right, th this is where it comes to a quick dead end <laughs> because, you know, the, the, you got to know people to be at that level. But I filled it out and I put it in. Needless to say, I wasn't in the running after that, but I did apply to be the MLB commissioner. Well, that kind of goes to your, to your anything is possible idea. Yeah. Like I say, I had a buddy who said possibilities are endless. That's right. Next headline. Dale had a dish named after him at a restaurant he performs at. Ooh, that. That may be a maybe. I want to, it's going to be false, but there is a maybe to that. Uh. The, re, the reason I say that, it wasn't actually named after me. There was another restaurant I used to go at, work at, or go to, didn't go to, or didn't work at. It was a restaurant I went to after work when I was a college instructor. And there was another instructor there. They had the Dale roast beef sandwich, which mm. was basically just a dip beef sandwich but my name was dale i worked at the college it wasn't me but i i would claim it as my hamburger you know take a girl there and go look they named a sandwich after me look at that yeah pull pull the waitress over and go um who named and then oh it's named after an instructor that works at the college yeah raise my hand and they'd look at me and they're like here's my id card i work at the college my name's yeah. dale that's right i'm an instructor so so far you got a yes and you got a maybe Oh, okay. Okay. I made that up, but you never know. All right. Last one. Dale was the first TEDx visual balloon interpreter. That is true. Oh, now you mentioned TEDx before. What, tell me about that. How'd that all come about? I have, I've been part of three TEDx's. I have been a visual balloon interpreter the very first time. The first one was TEDx Naperville. Wait, 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 back up. What is a visual balloon interpreter? That's what I said. I, I, I got called up and he goes, all right, we want you to be our visual balloon interpreter. You're going to be the first ever. Now, here's a guy who's heavily into the TEDx and the TED Talks. Mm -hmm. He's a guru of the TEDx program. I think he's on his number 12th, no, 10th show this year, or would have been 10th or 11th show this year that he would have put on consecutively. Okay. He hired me or called me in and said, okay, this is what I'd like you to do. And I went, explain this one more time to me. He goes, well, we've had these scribes before. What happens is the speaker comes up and we cut to a artist who's drawing out visually what the speaker is talking about. Oh, like a, like a court. Uh, yeah. So he's doing an animated mind map of the presentation. Mm. So if he says something quirky, he may draw a little quirky picture, or he may draw the words and then he does it. And they also had a painter who actually did an abstract version of your talk. So they wanted me to do that out of balloons. Okay. And I went, okay, how long are these talks? Oh, they're approximately, you know, nine to 18 minutes. How big do you want these? As big as you can make them. Okay. Hey, you know what would be really cool? How about you do that on stage? No, 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 no. We're going to put up a TED Talk, and we want you to map out live on stage the talk. Okay. 
all right, dude, do you, you realize what you're asking for? If you want me to do a dog, it's going to take me two minutes. If she mentions four things in eight minutes, yeah, I, I'm, I'm inflating a balloon and she's already done with the concept. Yeah. No, 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 you could do it. I, my mentor said, hey, it's a TEDx talk. Yeah. Shut up and say yes. Yes, I could do it. They had a series of, what was it, a dozen speakers, I think it was. I created a presentation for each speaker. Hmm. So they actually gave me a preliminary of what the speaking topic was. Okay. But they didn't tell us that they rewrote the speech halfway through. Oh, great. So I am sitting with an assistant who is helping me mind map some of these. And some of these I got to actually see the walk through the presentation to actually see what it was all about. And I could visually see what, oh man, they're talking about this. I'm going to build this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do this. Yeah. And TEDx talks are not the happiest talks. Sometimes. Most of them are really, when you get to them, they're, they're kind of grim. They're talking about, you know, people dying. And this was the solution to solving people dying. You know, we hope to do so. And you're like, okay, I'm going to re- talk about death here. What, what do I, how do I represent death? One example was, I didn't get the preliminary. There was a gentleman from Walgreens who actually came on who was saying that handicapped individuals are very good for their program. That They're actually hiring a lot of handicapped people. Mm -hmm. Visually, what's the first thing you think of when you say handicap? (laughs) Wheelchair. Yeah, so (laughs) handicap. Man, we're we're (laughs) cranking out a wheelchair. I'm working as fast as I can because I got 18 minutes to crank out a wheelchair. And he then goes on and talks about they're not physically challenged. They're mentally challenged. Oh, no. (laughs) How do you show a mentally challenged individual politically correct nicely? Not I'm. Yeah, without offending half the audience. Yeah, and you're sitting there going, all right, now they want this a think piece where people come out and they, they see the piece and they go, oh, I like that. Yes, it's a really good, relates back to the presentation. Mm-hmm. So I'm sitting there with a friend and he's like, screw it, just keep going the wheelchair. I'll, I'll find something out, you know? And <laughs> then they talk about social media was another thing was somebody popped out one. okay, this whole presentation is social media. What? How do you graphically show shows social media? Yeah. Facebook logo. Yes. Fa- All right. Big F blue background. So, you know, you're cranking out this stuff at this rapid pace and putting it together. And what they were doing was putting it on display. So after the speech, they'd have a couple speeches, they'd have an intermission, and then people would come out and they would see the artwork mm. afterwards. It was the most exciting, probably sculpturing. I had to do, it was probably the most difficult because you are literally taking concepts that have no real visualization and trying to make them visual. It, it's, it's balloon improv. Yes. And, the, and when I did my, my first one and they wanted me to do it on stage, uh, the speaker's topic was awesome. How, how often have you heard awesome? Awesome is the most overused word. How many times have you said awesome today? You said that pancake was awesome. Those birds are awesome. And she lists like 15 things just going through the word awesome. You're like, oh, you're like what do I pick? Oh, the speech was literally awesome. Man. I love the speech. <laughs> you know, you, the waitress thought it was awesome. You know, and you gave you a large tip and I had this dollar sign made she's talking about bees pollinating flowers are great so i got this big b letter b with a a b on it i'm sticking all these things as fast as i can that i've pre-made the grand canyon is awesome oh i remember that one freaking do grand canyon out of balloons (laughs) you know my my concept was create like a railing with binoculars that I made. Like I'm standing over the ground. Yeah, what are you going to do? Yeah, I'm acting this stuff out. And at the end, we had it set up where the house lights went out, black lights came on, and what I had done was built into the shapes of all the figures was the word awesome. That's pretty awesome. That was that Or something John just made up. Ah. TEDx has happened all around the world. You can keep pitching yourself for a TEDx. 
I mean, there's no reason why I, there there should be no boundaries as an entertainer. As a human being, we we should never be saying no to anything. We should be constantly pushing forward, seeing what's the final frontier, wherever we end up. And once we get there, there's still more after that. I love it. I love what you're doing. You know, one of the things I want people to look at that are listening to this is your blog because you offer so many things. How can someone get to that or how can someone get to your social media? All right. The easiest way to get to my blog, it's probably the oldest blog. If you Google my name, Dale Labrocta, you come up with 10,000 sites. My oldest site is mbd, the number two dot com, which stands for Magical Balloon Dude, two D's and Dude Dale. So it's D squared. So it's mbd, the number two dot com. Just click on blog. You'll get to my blog. I have been, I got over 600 blog posts. Go out there. Feel free to give some comments. If you want to find me on Facebook, look under balloons, plural, because I have more than one balloon, art. Mm -hmm. So it's balloons art is where you'll find me on Facebook. Well, thanks, Dale. That was fun. That was cool. Thank you, John. It's been always a blast talking to you. It was, it was super, super fun. And thanks to all my variety artists. Tell all your friends about the Variety Artist Podcast. If you know somebody else with some concrete advice, send them my way. And they'll go out and book those gigs, make some money, and have some fun. That's all for this episode of The Variety Artist. But your journey continues on our website. Go to thevarietyartist.com for more strategies, insight, and resources, as well as show notes on today's guest to assist you in your career. We'll see you on the next episode of The Variety Artist. But until then, go out and book those gigs, make some money, and have some fun.